excuse me, Psalm 89. I almost gave you the wrong reference right off the bat. Psalm 89. And the very first verse, it says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Jump over to Psalm 92, verses 1, 2, and 3. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with a solemn sound. Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Psalm 96, verses 1 and 2. O sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Psalm 98, verse 1. O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. Psalm 100, verses 1 and 2. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. And Psalm 101, verse 1. I will sing of mercy and judgment. Unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I chose all of these texts to start with because I couldn't settle on just one. <laughs> Today I want to preach about music, musicians, and praise to God. Uh, the Church of Christ denomination, or group, or cult, take your pick, are known for their congregational singing without any musical instruments. They sing a cappella. And uh, they argue that musical instruments are not mentioned in the New Testament. Paul writes in Ephesians 5.19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And uh, so they reason that singing is mentioned, but mechanical instruments, strings, woodwinds, or anything of that sort, uh, are not mentioned in the Bible. The real music uh, should reside in the heart. But the companion text, Colossians 3, verse 16, almost the same sentence construction, states, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, so the songs we sing should teach and admonish us in some ways. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So the music isn't confined only to the heart, but he's describing the, the condition of the heart, the attitude of the heart when you sing. It should be filled with the grace of God. And if that weren't enough, those two verses together each tell us that, we're to, that our singing is supposed to include the Psalms. Psalm 150, verses 3, 4, and 5. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high-sounding cymbals. I had a guy... Years ago, I was working for Focus on the Family when they were in California. And there was a guy in our department, and uh, he suggested that because the, that psalm mentions high cymbals, that justified a set of drums in a Christian rock band because they're elevated. And I said, well, the rest of it sounds more like an orchestra to me. I don't think he liked that comment very well. But verse 6 in that psalm says, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Uh, stringed instruments depend upon the air to convey the sound. Sometimes they're uh, up against a, a resonance box. Think of a, uh, the, the hollow guitar or the hollow violin or the, the a cello 
things of that sort to help magnify the sound uh, and reverberate the sound. And when you blow into a mouthpiece or reed instrument, you are giving it breath. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Amen. Musical instruments, just like your singing voice, are to be yielded and rendered uh, in the service of Jesus Christ. Most of you should know that the book of Psalms is the songbook or the hymn book of the Bible. The Psalms were written as prayers uh, and as historic records to rehearse the goodness of God to King David and the goodness of God to the nation of Israel. And they were to be sung by the people accompanied by musical instruments. And we read, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Psalm 149, verse 6. It's been said that uh, Christians have always traveled with two books in the service of Christ, the Bible and the songbook or the hymn book. David said in 1 Chronicles 20, 16, verses 23 and 24, Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Show forth from day to day his salvation. Declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among all nations. That's a missionary, that's an evangelistic appeal by those two verses. Way back in 1910, uh, on her 90th birthday, the great uh, hymn writer Fanny Crosby uh, received letters and telegrams from missionaries all around the world, thanking her and conveying to her how powerful her songs had been in helping win lost people to Jesus Christ. Excuse me, my eyes are tearing up. And musical, music is powerful uh, to that end. When the heart is in love, it wants to sing about the object of its affection. And when a Christian is in love with the Savior, it should be natural for him to want to sing about him. Our hymn books have over 500 songs in them. We have a hymn book in this auditorium. We have a different one over in our uh, fellowship hall. And each of them having uh, well over 500 songs in them. And except for a couple of patriotic hymns, you have over 500 songs in those books, each of them singing the, the praises of one man in human history. The Hindus and the Buddhists have nothing like that phenomenon. Roman Catholics have songbooks, but it's been my observation they very seldom sing out of them. Uh, and, and even then, it's just a, a mel simple melody line with a few guitar chords indicated uh, over it. They don't put together music and appreciate music in praise to Jesus Christ the way that we do, the way that we want to uh, and endeavor to. Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses uh, each have hymn books in their religions, but uh, every Mormon church uses the same hymnal as every other Mormon church, and every JW Kingdom Hall uses the same songbook as every other Kingdom Hall. And uh, those two hymn books or songbooks have been carefully written and crafted to perpetuate or promote their odd beliefs. And so that each church uses the same book as directed by their respective headquarters. There's no liberty from church to church among those people. For us, liberty means the freedom to do what's right. And then someone doesn't have to look over your shoulder and make you do it this way or that way. Nobody tells us which hymn books to order, which hymn books to buy. Nobody directs us which songs we can sing or shouldn't sing. Um, Baptists are still writing great Christian songs, great Christian music, and uh, in some cases, some good hymns. And um, the Pentecostal brethren, you have to give them this. They have been cranking out some real good gospel praise music for a long time now. Um, Isaac Watts, who wrote At the Cross, At the Cross where I first saw the light, he wrote We're Marching to Zion. He was a congregationalist. And John and Charles Wesley, who wrote Arise, My Soul, Arise, Shake Off Thy Guilty Fears, they founded the Methodist movement. So there is, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, the Bible says. So 
no one has to dictate to us which songs we should sing, which hymn books we should buy, uh, or how we should conduct our services and our music. That is something we glean as we study the scriptures and learn the word of God. So today I want to consider music, musicians, and praise. And frankly, you could teach an entire semester course on all of this today. I'm going to collapse it down and just hit some of the highlights in the next half hour. But first of all, uh, the music. There was a German Lutheran named Johann Sebastian Bach in the 17th century. Possibly the greatest, uh, the most well-known composer of all time, at least the father of the classical era. And he said this about music. Music is an agreeable harmony for the honor of God and the permissible delights of the soul. The permissible delights of the soul. The Apostle Peter tells us to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, 1 Peter 2, 11. If certain music only stimulates your, your uh, emotions and your hormones, that's bad music. Don't listen to it. Bach also said, I play the notes as they are written, but it is God who makes the music. He said the final aim, excuse me. He said the final aim and reason of all music is nothing other than the glorification of God and the refreshment of the spirit. That's pretty good. Music, at least in the life of a believer, ought to magnify the mercy and the goodness of God and inspire and encourage the saints. It should bring joy to the heart. It should stir you and move you to some sort of Christian service for Jesus' sake. You know, and despite what many claim, music is not uh, neutral. Music is not unbiased um, or indifferent. Think of how the right background music can affect your, your emotions when you're watching some romantic movie, some chick flick, right? Or even a horror movie. The right music set in the background can intensify and increase your reactions, make them much more dramatic when you're listening to it. And um, we're, we're blessed to have some very capable musicians in our church and uh, a burgeoning uh, orchestra among our young people that are learning their instruments and practicing them. And uh, I don't mean to embarrass him at all, but uh, we are, I'm so thankful God sent brother and sister Everett to be part of our church. And um, uh, brother Charles is a very humble man who believes the Bible is the word of God and thank the Lord for that. But, but he's a world-class musician, and we're just blessed to have him. And um, to having, having played in uh, numerous uh, symphony orchestras, the L.A. Philharmonic, and with some very famous conductors that many of you would recognize, uh, you're a world-class musician, Brother Charles, and we're very uh, grateful to have you play for us from time to time. And some of our uh, ladies are very capable pianists, and I appreciate them. And uh, one of our young women plays the cello, and I've encouraged her to keep at it. You're getting better and better all the time. And uh, so thank the Lord for that. And, uh, but uh, when Moses and Joshua came down from the mount, having just received the commandments from God, and Moses had the two tablets in his hand, Exodus 32, verses 17 and 18 tell us. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. Aaron had given in to the complaints and the impatience of the people, and he had helped them to create a golden image of a calf, an idol of a golden calf. And uh, those people had stripped off all their clothes, and they were doing the Watusi around that idol when Moses came on the scene. And complete rebellion against God. Complete rebellion against God. 
and um, as they had, and they had a certain soundtrack or or uh, singing to accompany them in their activities there. On the other hand, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, verse 14, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And then we read in verse 23 there, It came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. But music is not uh, indifferent. Music is not neutral. My, fr my uh, good friend, Brother Joe Sudarth, he was already a concert pianist when he and I started Bible school together. But he told me about his, his driving passion and his desire to improve the quality of our singing and our music among Bible-believing churches. And uh, because those things are not the most important elements in life, whether someone has a, a doctorate degrees on the wall or they've mastered something um, in the musical field, those are not the most important issues of life. Knowing the Word of God is most important for the Christian. And so because of that, we sometimes let a lot of bad music slip in, right? <laughs> because that, that's not the most important. I'll tell you one thing. When we were in, uh, when he and I were in Bible school, we had a guy there at Bible Baptist Church, Pensacola, and Pensacola Bible Institute. They have all kinds of music there. It's, a, it's all volunteer. They have a volunteer orchestra, about um, 40 pieces that sit on the floor in front of the platform. You know, horns, strings, some guys who played snare drum in their high school marching bands, they're invited to participate. And Dr. Ruckman used to play the tuba during the song service before he'd get up to preach. And uh, it's, it's uh, really a magnificent thing uh, for Christians to work together that way. We had a guy in the church, though, that uh, had finished third place in a national banjo picking competition in Nashville. And he was a student, and when he and a few other guys would get up with their bluegrass combo and they'd give a verse to him to pick, man, it was magnificent. You had to admit, that guy knew what he was doing. And uh, he had one joke I, I will remember, I do remember. He said, what's the difference between an onion and a banjo? And nobody says, nobody cries when you cut up a banjo. <laughs> but um, Bob Jones Sr.'s famous adage was that it is a sin to do less than your best. And to that, we would all say amen. But how often have we ever stood to sing a song or to play an instrument for the brethren without having practiced sufficiently? In those times, we're giving both God and our fellow Christians less than our best. And uh, to borrow from James, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. The right music can have a very powerful effect on the saints. And the right chord progression at the right time, uh, played well, can help to move the sinner to the point of conviction where he, he's ready to say yes to Jesus Christ when an invitation is given. And so all of these things work together from the way you shake hands with the visitor to the way you greet them, the way you behave in front of them, the way we sing, the way we play, all of these things should go, should work together to help bring lost people to Jesus Christ and stir the hearts of those who know Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, my goodness, I, I've been tearing up quite a bit um, medical side effect from some of my treatments. But uh, anyway, forgive me for that. My main problem is I want to be able to read my notes here. <laughs> but whether it's classical or orchestral style or southern gospel or black gospel or traditional hymn singing or bluegrass or chamber choir or barbershop quartet, if it's intended to glorify and magnify God, then it should be done well. King Saul told his servants, provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. First Samuel 16, 17. That's when they brought in uh, the shepherd named David. 
which leads me to my second point, the musicians. There are several men listed by name in the scriptures who were known for their musical um, and singing abilities. The first man was named Jubal, Genesis 4, verse 21. He was the great, 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 great grandson of Adam, the seventh uh, generation after. And he was the first one to create musical instruments. He's said to be the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. The harp would represent all stringed instruments and the organ representing anything that uses uh, wind to produce sound. Drums are not a musical instrument. They are percussion and they help provide tempo and, and rhythm uh, in, as necessary, but they're not musical instruments. After Jubal, we read about uh, three chief musicians at the time of King David. Their names were Heman, or He-Man, if you guys want to call them that, so you don't feel like a sissy when you're singing. Uh, Asaph and Jeduthun, they're mentioned in 1 Chronicles 16. And their principal job was to supply praise on musical instruments, trumpets, cymbals, etc., as the sacrifices were being offered on the altar. And God considered that an important job, an important task to provide the best music, the best praise when the animals were being offered and the priests were slaughtering the sacrifices uh, that we were to praise, they were to praise God at that moment. And there were two others who were renowned on the trumpets. Their names were Benaiah and Jehaziel, 1 Chronicles 16, verse 6. We read, And Kenaniah, chief of the Levites, was for song, uh, he instructed about the song because he was skillful. First Chronicles 15, verse 22. He taught others how to sing. And there were many more, but these were the principal ones. The Bible later uh, says that the children, uh, the sons and daughters, of those three principal men, Heman, uh, Asaph, and Jeduthun, it says, we, re we read later, so the number of them with their brethren that were instructed in the songs of the Lord, even all that were cunning was two hundred four score and eight, two hundred eighty-eight. First Chronicles twenty-five, verse seven. Brother Sudarf asked me, "Wouldn't it be great to attract an orchestra of eighty-eight gifted musicians and two hundred singers who knew how to sing and carry a note and work together and showcase them all around the world?" Uh, in the best uh, concert venues available. And we talked about how something like that might uh, come to pass. And he said uh, he wanted everyone to be a Bible believer. And that's where the problem comes in. You can find uh, some very fine and capable musicians who are saved, but do they believe God's book from cover to cover? And the biggest challenge to something like that is not an impossibility. I think that, that vision has some great merit. But um, <clears throat> the biggest challenge wouldn't be the rehearsals, the expense, the logistics, and the travel, and so forth. The biggest challenge would be finding 288 uh, like-minded believers who were trying to live right, knew that they were saved, knew that they were kept saved, and believed the King James Bible was the perfect word of God. That'd be the biggest challenge. But let's also... Uh, before we go any further, let's review the instruments that are mentioned in the Bible. We have the trumpet, and I suppose that was uh, originated with a, a ram's horn hollowed out, or I think they call it a shofar today in, the, in Judaism, um, uh, sometimes later made of silver or brass. We have the cornet, Psalm 98, verse 6, very similar to a brass trumpet. We have cymbals, two concave plates that were playing together to make a sound. Everybody knows what they sound like. There's the timbrel, and the main consonants of that word, T-M-B-R, uh, give us the word tambourine today. Uh, around a wooden hoop, perhaps with a skin stretched across it, so it made a, a sort of a, a resonating percussion sound uh, along with the music. I don't know when they began to add small little uh, symbols around the edges of it, but 
We have uh, the dulcimer, which you can still find today in obscure music shops. Uh, that was a, a resonance box with strings stretched down the length of it. There's the flute mentioned in Judges 5 and Daniel chapter 3. That was a straight pipe with uh, finger holes. Uh, the recorder is probably more close, closely resembles that today than anything else. The flutes, the modern flutes, have a whole system of valves uh, open and close the airflow. There's the harp uh, made of wood with 10 strings, Psalm 92 verse 3 stretched across it. Uh, the organ, not the keyboard type, but a simple reed instrument. Think of an oboe or something like that. There's the psaltery. That's another stringed instrument like the harp. The sackbut, mentioned in Daniel 3, which has nothing to do with a sack like bagpipes or your backside, your butt. <laughs> Forgive me. But uh, all the uh, uh, Bible authorities I could consult on this subject suggested that the, the sackbut was another portable stringed instrument. I did find one source that thought the sackbut was actually related to a trumpet, a brass trumpet, which actually had a, a moving slide to adjust the sound, like a precursor to the modern trombone. But I don't think anyone knows exactly for sure uh, what the sackbut was or what it looked like. And then lastly, there's the vial, V-I-O-L, Isaiah 5, verse 12, and Amos 6, verse 5. That's yet another stringed instrument. But what does that word make you think of? Violin, viola, or cello, etc. And um, going back to the sack, but by the way, that little toy that we all have, beep, that's not a complex design, right? There's nothing complicated about that. And so if the sackbut had something like a movable slide, it's entirely possible that such an instrument was devised eight, 900 years before Christ in the time of the Babylonian captivity. Now, whether it's the form of the music itself, by the way, there's no rap or hip hop or, or death metal or rock and roll in the Bible or the um, singing and the playing of the instruments, it should all be done in the service of the Lord. Colossians 3, verse 17 states, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. It's a sin to do less than your best. And thirdly, lastly, let's talk about the praise. We like that. To praise God is to offer thanks to God and worship for every quality that he possesses, every attribute of God, every characteristic of God, his uh, actions, his kindnesses towards you, every act of love, every answer to prayer, every judgment, every rebuke, every blessing, every disappointment. The Bible says giving thanks always for all things, Ephesians 5.20, the good and the bad. Uh, to worship his name and all that it represents. There isn't. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. To worship his, uh, to worship him for his ultimate power throughout the universe. How could a medical doctor, what, what medical doctor? or surgeon shouldn't be able to marvel at the creative genius of God in designing the, the human heart and its functions and its continuous beating or the, the way the synapses fire in the brain. If you don't have any reason to thank God and praise God or marvel at God, uh, think of those two reasons. Uh, and from the first text that I read at the start, we learn that we're to sing praise to God for his mercies. Someone has defined the uh, difference between grace and mercy this way. Grace is God giving you something that you don't deserve. The forgiveness of your sins, a home in heaven, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and so forth. And mercy is what keeps God from giving you what you do deserve. Amen. Judgment, 
wrath? How many times have you sinned and you thought, man, if God saw that and God knows about that, I'm in for a real judgment. I don't know how it's going to come, but I know it's going to And yet nothing happened. God let you skate by. When you know you deserve something from God. Think, we're, we're to thank him for his faithfulness. Think of how God has kept the Jewish race alive despite all the odds against them. We're to praise him, the rock of our salvation. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. For his victory, his victory over sin, his victory over Satan, his victory over the world, his victory over the skeptics, his victory over the mockers and the doubters uh, and the scorners, his victory over death and the grave and decay, and his future victory over the coming Antichrist. We're to thank him for that and praise him for that. And how are we supposed to praise him? Psalm 100, verse 1, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Second Chronicles 20, verse 19, and the Levites and the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. Psalm 33, verse 3, sing unto him a new song, play skillfully with a loud noise. Isaiah 12, verses 5 and 6, sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things this is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. The Word of God tells us uh, to both play and sing skillfully. I mean, you want to hit the right notes, right? Now, let's, going to bring, this to, let's bring this to a conclusion. I'm glad that we have a chance to sing. Not everybody has a, a natural talent to sing. Some people hear music on the radio, but they can't reproduce it with their own voice. They have a, I don't know, a, a tone deaf, uh, I guess is their gift, right? But uh, if you can sing for Jesus Christ, you should. You should look for every opportunity. Whether someone say, hey, join our group. Let's, let's put together a, a men's uh, quartet or a women's group or something like that. Don't be afraid to participate in that. And when you do, do it with the very best, to the very best of your ability. Sing the right notes, hit the right note. Now there's a, now I mentioned last week to some of you, there's a different voice you use for singing and than the one you use for preaching on the sidewalks, right? Each of them have their place, but each of them serve a different purpose. When Jesus preached to multitudes hanging on every word, they had no sound equipment. He had to preach. He had to shout out loud when he had thousands of people listening. We often don't think of that when we read the Bible, but undoubtedly he had to. But when they were in the upper room and they sang a hymn and went out, I'm sure he didn't shout like that. I'm sure they used a different voice to sing with. So bear that in mind. We're going to bring this to a close and I'm going to ask the ladies to come back to the, the instruments. And I'm going to ask you all to turn to page 180 and uh, we're going to sing, and hopefully those who watch us on the uh, internet will see how we sing here at Bible Baptist Church International. Let me ask you to stand and sing it out loud like you mean it and the way we always do, all right? <laughs> on the first verse. There will never be a sweeter story, story of the Savior's love divine. Love that brought him from the realms of glory, just to save a sinful soul. Amen. Let me hear you. Isn't the love of Jesus something more?
right, we'll stop right there.